We're continuing our preaching series today called Straight From The Heart, in which we've invited a number of people, some from our church and some from other places, to speak to us straight from their heart about the lessons they've been learning during these difficult days. We're finding out what truths they're hanging on to. We're asking them what God's been saying to them, and we're catching together the things that we really need to know and to hang on to during this difficult season. Our speaker today is Eric Jesperson. Eric's based in Woking and is part of Emmaus Road Church, but is known by lots of us because together with his wife, Rebecca, they run the Lighthouse Project and lead that. The Lighthouse is in the middle of Woking. It's here to help people in need and difficulty. And can I say as well, Eric's been a real treat for me as I've been in this town just three years. I found him to be friendly, welcoming, warm, and a great encouragement. And I count him a friend. And so I'm absolutely delighted to have Eric speaking to us today. So get yourself ready. I know you're going to meet with God and be encouraged. Eric. Thank you, Steve, and hello, welcome, church. It is wonderful to be with you today. My wife and I have lived in Woking for over 20 years, and we have loads of dear friends in this church, and so it's a, a huge privilege and joy to share it with you today. The past three years, I know, have just been a time of incredible change and transition for you as a church, and we've been watching and cheering you on as God has been inaugurating a fresh season for you. You're a church that has such a strong legacy in this town, and, and I really honor that. Um, you know, you've been here over 140 years, this worship and mission and church planting, this faithful witness in the town. And, and I really believe that because of that, there's a divine favor that rests on you, an authority and an equity that comes from your faithful witness in this geography. And uh, I've personally been inspired by the accounts and the stories I've heard over the years of seasons of outpouring and uh, the waves of the Holy Spirit and growth, uh, seasons marked by deep hunger for God and fervent prayer and radical devotion that's been marked by people even selling their precious possessions to give to the work of God. Uh, where there have been signs and wonders and all those sorts of things. So uh, I find you such an inspiring church and thank you for who you are. And haven't these past few years been so exciting? Under Steve's leadership, uh, you've bowed the knee in humility before God to recommit and reconsecrate yourselves to your mission and your purpose. And uh, you've embraced a change in culture that's reflected in your name, a church that truly stands with open arms to the community, stands with welcome to them. And then there's been this long-awaited opening of your beautiful new space, which surely felt like a consolidation and confirmation of the work that God has been doing among you. And we were here celebrating with you on your launch Sunday, and, uh, and there was a palpable sense of excitement and momentum, just expectation at what God was and is doing. Like there was an unstoppable advancement of God's kingdom with and through you. You know, your welcome stories and your alpha courses and welcome works, overflowing financial generosity. You know, surely 2020 would be remembered as this year of incredible advancement and breakthrough. And so it might feel really hard to have that sense of momentum seemingly interrupted by the storm of the coronavirus. Uh, it may be that when we look back, 2020 is remembered as something quite different. The way that lockdown has closed doors and limited the usual kingdom activity. And of course, there's been impressive adaptation and adjustment, not just moving services and courses online, but also looking outward like your amazing around the world fundraiser. Am I right? You guys raised over 32,000 pounds. Just brilliant. But it's still admittedly hugely disruptive, painful and disorienting for us all. For church, for work, for families, for school, for university, for travels, for weddings, for careers. And, you know, as we journey through the summer with the desire of greater normality, hopefully returning in the coming months, 
yet also the prospect of continued uncertainty. It's a good time to reflect on what God has been saying and doing in us. And as I've personally tried to make sense of this season, I've been drawn again to the life of Daniel in the Bible. Alongside biblical heroes like Job and Joseph, Daniel is one of the most helpful people to study when unexpected or traumatic things happen. I know Chris Kimbangi did a great talk on Daniel 6 recently, so I'm in very good company here. And today I'd like to share straight from the heart some of the simple lessons that I've been learning from the life of Daniel. But first, let me ask this question. What is your response when things don't work out? How do you respond emotionally or practically when really unexpected things happen? Do you find it easiest just to surrender to God, to just say, oh, he knows best? Or do you try to grab the bull by the horns and you know, take your destiny into your own hands? Do you get stressed and overactive and buy a thousand toilet rolls and build a nuclear bunker in your backyard? Or do you get depressed and withdraw into passivity or confusion? Do you throw yourself onto God or do you distance yourself from God? I'm not looking for a right or a wrong answer. That's not the point here, but just the honesty of self-reflection. That's a really helpful starting point. So on that note, let's read the opening verses of Daniel's story. This is Daniel 1, chapter 1, verse 1 to 7. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia, put it in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians, the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the, na the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. Let's put ourselves in Daniel's shoes. What was Daniel's upbringing and expectation? We enter his story as a young man, perhaps a teenager or young adult. He was royalty, noble blood, a prince in Israel, handsome, bright, educated at the best schools, destined for great things. It says there, they were young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. You know, if we, if we try and transport Daniel into our modern context, just imagining this young man full of incredible potential, sporty and good looking and smart and surrounded by friends and favor and everybody looking on with great expectation at the bright future he has in front of him. He's a noble, he's a prince in the land. 
Uh, he has influence and, uh, and this incredible future standing in front of him. How does he feel about himself at that time? What does he think as this person who belongs to God's chosen, favored people in the whole world? What was he thinking when the Babylonian army gathered around his city? Would God deliver them? God had done that many times before. Surely they were expecting a miracle. You know, this is God's chosen people, his holy city, God's sacred temple. Surely God would protect them. That's a logical assumption for Daniel and his friends. You know, Babylon is the epitome of pagan godlessness. In Revelation, Babylon represents everything about evil power, about a culture that will be destroyed by God. You read in Revelation 17, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. You know, Babylon is this evil, ugly caricature of everything that's different to God's chosen people. Of course God would deliver them from the Babylonians. And yet God didn't save them. The city was captured. All the leaders, the soldiers, the craftsmen taken captive, made prisoners of war. You have to admit those are pretty unexpected circumstances. Daniel, this bright young man captured, becomes a prisoner of war, loses his home, is cut off from his family, is taken to a foreign land as evil as you could imagine. His name is changed to Belteshazzar, which is, he's named after one of the demonic gods of Babylon. Uh, we understand from the scriptures he's most likely castrated. He's made to study the occult. He has to serve a demon worshiping tyrannical boss. I mean, how does that compare with your unexpected circumstances? Would it be reasonable for Daniel to panic about his future? To think that God had abandoned him? To believe that God wasn't in control? Would Daniel be justified in thinking that God was no longer on his throne? Yet Daniel, in these appalling and unexpected circumstances, doesn't just somehow survive and endure. We actually discover that he thrives. He blossoms, he bears fruit, he fulfills his life calling. Daniel becomes the leader he was always destined to be. He becomes a significant influence in the most powerful kingdom of the day, touching the lives of thousands and even bringing spiritual leadership to the tyrant kings that he serves. Isn't that amazing? How does Daniel do that? Here are four things we see in Daniel that cause him to not just survive, but to thrive, regardless of his circumstances. And the four things are his perspective, his hope, his humility, and his wisdom. Four things that I want to share today. The first is his perspective. Daniel's whole perspective in all that happens is that God is on his throne. The recurrent theme throughout Daniel's life is God's sovereignty. It's summed up in these words, Daniel chapter 2. It says in verse 19 to 21, Daniel praised the God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises others up. Daniel carries this deep conviction. It's so, so deep, God's sovereignty within him, that God actually uses Daniel to teach pagan kings about God's sovereignty. Daniel says to one king, 
The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds of the sky. This wasn't you gaining power. This was God sovereignly giving it to you. Later on, he says, seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and he gives them to anyone he wishes. Your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Daniel says to another king, the most high God is sovereign over all the kingdoms of the earth. When you read later on in Daniel, all these strange prophetic visions and revelations about uh, kingdoms and powers rising and falling, you could basically, basically summarize those chapters in two words. God wins. God is sovereign. Isn't that ironic? that someone who's had their personal sovereignty violated and removed in such an awful, traumatic way is actually called to teach rulers who have almost unlimited power in the world about God's sovereignty over them. Surely Daniel would be someone who had issue with God's sovereignty. You know, he's been enslaved, castrated, removed from everything he cares about. Daniel should have serious questions about God being sovereign. And when terrible things happen, that's an often legitimate and understandable response. God, if you're sovereign, why would you let this happen? And yet for Daniel, God's sovereignty actually becomes his life message. And it's this truth that leads to the second attribute in Daniel's life that I want to talk about, and that is Daniel's hope. If you've been around church for a while, you'll have heard these verses from Jeremiah 29, 11. We love them. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Do you know the context of those words? It's actually a whole prophecy spoken to Daniel's contemporaries stuck in exile in Babylon. It's speaking into this situation. And at the time that the prophet Jeremiah writes these words, speaks these words, the exiles have been stuck in this situation of exile for about seven years. And they are still, after seven years, struggling to come to terms with it. They're still confused and disoriented. Have you ever been in one of those situations, a scene in an airport where all the flights are canceled or delayed for many hours and there's just thousands of people sitting around just waiting and waiting and waiting to get out of that place? Well, that's how the exiles were at this stage in Babylon. They were in limbo. They were hopeless, just mourning their sense of loss, stuck in passivity not willing to really accept where they were. If you're old enough, you might remember that Boney M song, By the Rivers of Babylon, where we sat down, we wept when we remembered Zion. Well, those are actually lyrics from Psalm 137, and it was a psalm written about the exiles in this moment. You know, the people were, were, of God were depressed, saying, how can we possibly sing songs of praise and worship in this situation? And so through the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord speaks these words of encouragement to help them accept their circumstances. And in Jeremiah 29, he's calling them to actually respond to the soil they've been placed in, to plant seeds and to thrive even in this challenging environment. And so he speaks words of promise and hope for their future. And if you read in Daniel chapter 9, we find Daniel himself years later reading these very words of Jeremiah, reading these words of hope and encouragement to the people of God. And what Daniel does in response to those words is really important because he turns these words into prayer. Not apathetic prayer, 
not resigned prayer, not timid prayer, but bold prayer, passionate prayer, courageous prayer. Because for Daniel, hope is not just wishful thinking. Daniel has true biblical hope, which is confidence and certainty. And so he reads Jeremiah 29, and he sees certainty in the promises of God in that scripture. Verse 10, I will come to you and fulfill my good promises. Verse 11 of Jeremiah 29, I know the plans I have for you. Verse 12, I will listen to you. Verse 14, I will be found by you. I will gather you. I will bring you back. Daniel hears those words, responds to them in incredible prayer. Daniel chapter 9 is one of the most amazing prayers in the whole Bible. It includes intercession and repentance and standing in the gap, dealing with generational sin, claiming God's promises, declaring God's character. You should study it. It's an incredible response because Daniel has hope. So here's a question. What kind of prayer does your hope cause you to pray. 2 Corinthians 3.12 says, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. And Romans 12.12, be joyful in hope, persevering in affliction, faithful in prayer. So what kind of prayers does your hope cause you to pray? Talking about Daniel's prayer life leads us on to the next thing, his humility, Daniel's humility. We read this in Daniel chapter 10. An angel says to him, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. Daniel's prayerful and practical posture in life is marked by humility. Now, biblical humility is not low self-esteem or being a doormat. Daniel is actually incredibly secure about his strengths and his gifts. It's Daniel who describes himself in chapter one as uh, one of the young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Daniel certainly doesn't suffer from low self-esteem, does he? You see, biblical humility comes from strength, not weakness. It starts with having power, knowing who you are in God. But humility is a deliberate choice to use your power or surrender your power for the sake of others. John chapter 13 says that Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, because of that knowledge, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. Knowing who he was, Jesus got on his knees and washed his disciples' feet. Humility is using your strength, using your power, your gifts to serve others. It's Dub using his physical strength to do a daily press-up challenge in order to raise awareness of those struggling with mental health issues. It's a, assessing your circumstances, whatever they may be, and asking yourself, what can I do here? How can I take my strength, my resources, my abilities, and serve others at this time? And so Daniel did this. He took his excellence and used it to serve others. And not just his people, not just his friends, but even his enemies. And this leads on to my fourth point. Daniel's perspective of God on the throne 
Daniel's hope, Daniel's humility. And the fourth thing is Daniel's wisdom. That verse we looked at in Daniel 10 said that Daniel sought to gain understanding as he humbled himself before God. Again and again through the book of Daniel, we see a man marked by heavenly understanding, marked by wisdom. And in the New Testament, the, uh, James writes this. He says in chapter three, the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It is also peace loving, gentle at all times and willing to yield to others. It is full of mercy and the fruits of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. And those who are peacemakers will plant seeds of peace and reap a harvest of justice. Earlier in Daniel's story, in chapter two, Daniel wakes up one day to the most surprising and challenging knock at his front door, announcing that the king has ordered for him and all the other royal advisors to be executed. Now, what would you do if you received that knock at the door, if you got that terrifying news of a death sentence? Does Daniel shout and scream? Does he get defensive? Does he recite all the good things he's done? Does he tell the king to go ahead and kill all those evil Babylonian magicians, but save him and the good Hebrews? No, it says he handles this situation with wisdom and tact. He speaks gently and peaceably. He yields to the authority whilst politely, politely questioning the situation. He shows no favoritism, seeking to save everyone, not just himself and his friends. And he negotiates a stay of execution with the king and comes up with a win-win solution. That is wisdom in action. Wisdom is, is more than knowledge, it's more than facts. It's the ability to use insight with skill and effectiveness. It's profoundly practical. And in a season like this that we face in our time, we can learn from Daniel to seek God's wisdom. Heavenly strategies and, and innovative solutions for our time heavenly wisdom that, that's intertwined with humility that can enable us to navigate our way forward. You know, even when our economies and our communities seem to have an impending doom knocking at the door, we can respond with wisdom and tact. We can find innovative solutions to not only save ourselves or our families, but to save our cities to save our communities, even those who we perceive hate us, who are not standing with us. Wisdom from heaven can give us the tools to do that. And so as we, as the people of God, move forward into whatever lays ahead of us, I want you to know that this is a time for you, welcome church, to see that your momentum has not been halted and you are not simply trying to survive this inconvenient blip. God has positioned you for such a time as this. You are called to be a people who pivot with agility and creativity, a people who know that God is on the throne. And so you can carry hope for this city, this community. With humility and wisdom, you can seek God for heavenly solutions, for the salvation and the deliverance of this community. So be encouraged at this time. Be bold. God is calling you to thrive. Would you pray with me right now? I want to pray for Welcome Church and I want to pray for anyone who's listening to this message right now for the Spirit of God to enter your space right now, to enter your heart, to enter your life with those attributes that Daniel carried. So let's pray. 
God, thank you that we can look at heroes of the faith like Daniel and see how they carried themselves in circumstances that were utterly unexpected. And we thank you, God, for this perspective that you are on your throne. May each one of us know that deeply right now. We thank you that we're called to be people of hope. So may each one of us experience your hope right now. We thank you that we are called to be people of humility who take our strength and our power and our resources and direct it for the sake of others. And so we pray, God, for that impartation to us now to be people who are not self-serving, but who look outward. We thank you, God, that we're called to be people of wisdom. And so we pray for the gift of wisdom. We ask for the deposit from heaven of your wisdom, the innovative and creative strategies, not for just ourselves and our families or our friends, but for all the people around us, for our communities, for our cities, for our nation. God, would you give us these things right now? We come with openness to you. We posture our whole lives towards you as Daniel did. And we receive this now in faith for your glory. Amen. Amen. Welcome, church. Thank you so much for letting me share with you today. What a privilege it's been to have this time with you. God bless you.